A third coronavirus vaccine could be available in the U.S. by the end of this month. Johnson & Johnson has asked the FDA to authorize its vaccine for emergency use. The new vaccine only requires one dose and does not need ultra-cold storage. If approved, the company says it could ship 100 million doses in the next few months. But the shots cannot come fast enough. CBS News national correspondent David Begno tells us several of the new variants of the virus are spreading. Ashley Jackson says she met her husband, Alfonsie, on a blind date. Was it meant to be from the beginning? It was for me. I was kind of skeptical, but probably like <laughs> the two were married for nearly eight years. They have two young daughters, but their life together was cut short on Tuesday when Alfonsie died with COVID-19. Were you able to be there with him when he passed away? Through a window. It was like I was so far away, but I was close, but I was so far away. Even though the nurse, you know, held his hand and stuff, it, it just still didn't feel the same for me. I, I would rather did that. He had had flu-like symptoms, but he tested negative for COVID. He then got short of breath. He went to the emergency room. Doctors said his heart was failing. And then a few days later, they tested him again. I got the call from the health department saying, hey, your husband has a, is the first person in Alabama with the, the UK strain. That strain was first detected in the United Kingdom thanks to a national coordinated effort to sequence samples of the virus to look for mutations. In this case, the strain had become more contagious and potentially more lethal. Identifying a dangerous variant early enough is crucial because it could help stop the spread. While UK scientists recently sequenced more than 12,000 COVID samples in a single week, here in the United States, we're only doing about 5,000 a week. It's highly likely that there are variants that we are not picking up. That is Jennifer Dienbard. She's the director of a lab at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. She sequences samples from all over L.A. County. Now, she knows what variants are spreading there, but she says labs like hers aren't getting or they aren't sharing data at a national level. If we see something here and let's say it's only one or two cases, um, we may not recognize the, the importance or severity of it, unless there are also other states, other cities that are seeing the same thing. Mrs. Jackson says Alabama hadn't seen that variant first detected in the UK until they found it in three people, including her husband. Did you get the sense that he was scared? Yes, extremely, extremely. He was like, I didn't get a chance to walk my girls down the aisle or teach them how to drive. He don't have the opportunity to do those things. You may be asking yourself, did Alfonsier have any pre-existing conditions? Ashley says none that they knew of. He wore his mask all the time. He went from home to work and home to work. Didn't have much contact with other people, she says, over the last several months. Yet he still died in his mid-30s. David Begno, CBS News, Charleston, West Virginia. Joining us now is infectious disease specialist, Dr. Uzma Syed. She's the director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Center of Excellence at Good Samaritan Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Syed, welcome. Great to have you with us. So we heard from one woman whose husband died from COVID, but despite having symptoms, he didn't initially test positive for the virus until it was too late. It turns out he had the strain that originated in the UK. Can you explain why a person showing symptoms would test negative? And should we be concerned that the tests we're using are not able to pick up these variants? Yeah, so, you know, the FDA had issued some guidance around this, Tanya, that certain molecular tests can give 
false uh, negative results. Um, and out of the abundance of caution, they had mentioned um, tests such as the Acula, the TACPATH, and the Linea uh, can do that. But, you know, we have to also remember that there are a lot of nuances with testing. Um, some of this can be just, you know, when the patient is tested, how the specimen is collected. We already know that it, this is very much dependent on who's doing the test and how adequate of a sample that they're getting. Um, but, you know, this is something that we are certainly watching and concerned about with the emerging variants and how much widespread these variants uh, have been proven to be already uh, in the U.S. with over, uh, you know, 33 states and over 540 or plus cases being reported, um, that this is definitely uh, something that's in constant um, evolution right now that we are watching. And, of course, the good news is Johnson & Johnson is asking the FDA to give its vaccine emergency use authorization. So that will be another vaccine out there, even though it does have a lower efficacy uh, rate against COVID than the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. With the concerns about the variants now circulating, how effective do you believe this third vaccine will be? And have public health officials accepted that people will probably catch the virus and are shifting to simply preventing hospitalizations and deaths? I think this is great news, as you just highlighted. You know, the more vaccines that have been vetted and have passed through all the safety and efficacy profiles and have been then submitted to FDA and received approval, the better chances we are going to have to really get ahead of this. You know, it really is a race against the variants. So the more vaccine candidates that we have, the, the more supply that we have, the quicker we can vaccinate people and really prevent these variants from really uh, becoming dominant. Um, and that's really the goal right now is to really ultimately vaccinate vaccinate as many people as we can. And, um, you know, the data is uh, showing a lot of promise where 85 percent of severe cases uh, are being prevented. Um, and that's really what we have to focus on as well with the amount of mortality that we're seeing globally and nationally um, is that the more tools that we can have in our toolbox, uh, the better equipped we will be to really um, get this pandemic behind us. Certainly. More vaccines, the better. Um, so, Dr. Syed, back in the fall, public health officials warned of a potential twin-demic with COVID and the flu. And February is normally the height of flu season. But the CDC is reporting fewer than 1,500 flu cases since September and only one child death so far this season. As tragic as that is, of course, we usually see more. Compared to last season, um, you know, we had 188 pediatric deaths. So why is it, with all the precautions being taken, we're able to beat one respiratory illness but not both? I think this is, you know, something uh, great to highlight right now is that we are seeing dramatically low cases of flu and, and partly because of vaccinations, partly because of our infection prevention measures such as mask wearing. We can see, as you mentioned, that we are able to really keep flu under control. We know that flu and COVID are not the same, and we have sort of proven that now uh, more than a year into this that COVID, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the disease COVID-19, is far more um, transmissible and especially even more so with the new variants. Um, so we can see that, you know, our good uh, public health measures are working for other respiratory viruses. Um, and we have to just not let our guard down right now because, you know, although the cases are really low right now, there is still potential that they could go up more in the next few months. But we are doing the right things by continuing to wear masks and get vaccinated. Um, and really, you know, the last thing that we would need is to, you know, have that twindemic. So at least that's some more good news um, is that we don't have to deal with that at this point. And we are hearing that some countries are looking at mixing vaccines. For example, the UK is experimenting with mixing Pfizer, BioNTech and AstraZeneca doses. What are your thoughts on that? And is that something we should consider here in the U.S.? I think everything has to be really put through a very stringent scientific process. Um, you know, we have to have the data, we have to have good um, clinical trials in place to really prove safety and efficacy in a process and, and show good results with that. So anything that is new has to really go through strict um, processes that, you know, the, the way that we do it traditionally um, and really been, be proven to be safe and efficacious. Um, sometimes, you know, we tend to do things um, and what's happening globally as well. Uh, because of simple supply and demand issues. So, you know, we have to stay true to science as well. And time will tell. You know, I know they are establishing uh, clinical trials to see um, this, and I'm interested to see what the results might be. But um, we can't just simply put a blanket uh, statement out there. We have to stick to the science and 
let science guide us as it always has. Dr. Uzma Sayed, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Tanya.